here today to talk about the holiday trimmings competition. Uh, hopefully give you guys some useful information uh, during this uh, what six or eight week, however many weeks journey it is, and hopefully uh, on after that as well. A lot of people have asked is what's keeping you? What is the reason that you're not, your perception of why you're not able to exercise? Um, you know, you get up in the morning, take the kids to school, or you just come to work, uh, lunch, you want to eat lunch because you're starving, afterwards you're tired, you don't want to uh, go work out. There's all these different types of things. Here's some most, one of the most common things that we see. There's not enough time, even though we're open 18 and a half hours a day. Um, you're too tired. Um, this is a big one, number three, and this, this concerns me a lot, and I don't like to hear people say this because I feel like we're not doing our jobs right. I, do not, I don't know what to do, uh, or they have failed in the past. Um, exercise is boring. Uh, I'm self-conscious, and I am the, the honest ones at the bottom. I'm just lazy. I don't want to exercise. So, um, these are some of the things that we see most common, and a lot of these are true. I mean, there's, there's times in the day that you may not have enough time that particular day, but it's not going to be every day. Um, too tired, once you get in that exercise routine, you're going to see your energy levels go up and you're going to want to exercise. Believe it or not, you'll even start to feel guilty if you don't exercise. So that, that's what we try to tell people and try to get them really motivated and, and involved. Now number three is what Randy and I are there for. Um, we try to tell people not what to do as far as exercise, but how to exercise. And how to mix that up so that it's not um, And those people that are self-conscious, we had people in this competition that didn't want to weigh in. They were concerned about their weight. They were very concerned about their BMI. And, but you've got to start somewhere. I mean, you, you have, if you're going to do this, you have to start somewhere. So I was very proud of those people for coming over, you know? Um, so Randy's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what physical fitness means. And then we'll kind of switch back and forth on the presentation and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, so before you start on an exercise program, what I like to tell my students and a lot of my clients is when you start exercising, remember your fitness is not something that you just improve one part of your body. If you start exercising, you know, your strength is going to get better. Okay, so and obviously your endurance will get better. Mobility gets better. So remember, as you're working on your, bot on, on your physical fitness, your whole body is changing. It's not just, okay, I lose weight, or maybe I start lifting weights, and that's all the improvements I see. Everything's improving in your body. If you go to our, a lot of our fitness classes in the Wellness Center, you probably know that we work on a lot of different components. If you go to Cardio Fusion, for example, uh, that works on a lot of strength, and works on a lot of endurance. If you have the pleasure of working out with me, um, <laughs> which most people don't like, you get, uh, we tackle everything. So we do a little bit of strength, we do a little bit of endurance, cardiovascular, anaerobic training flexibility. So remember that you know the, the body is a system. Okay, so for example, if you guys, a lot of us have those problematic areas you want to get rid of on our body, but if you lose fat in one area, you're going to lose it in another. Men, you, you carry more, we carry more of our fat up here, women, it's more down here. So if you lose it in one area, you're going to lose it in another. There's no such thing as spot reduction. No such thing as spot reduction. You will see changes throughout your body because everybody distributes their body fat stores on this. So just keep that in mind. When you're, uh, about the okay. Simple equation, we know this. If your intake is greater than your expenditure, what happens? You gain weight. If your intake is less than your expenditure, there's a weight loss there. A good saying is, eat a little less, move a little more. And that, that's, a, that's a true statement when it comes to working out and losing weight. If you are fortunate enough and your, your intake is the same as your expenditure, that's a weight maintenance. So you don't lose weight and you don't gain weight. Some of you in here I recognize from the wellness center you've been working out for a long time. Some of you have come to me and said, hey Randy, my weight hasn't moved or you know, numbers on the scale aren't moving, what can I do? Well, you probably have that maintenance phase. That means either you're eating a little too much than what you were before, or maybe your exercise has gotten relaxed, you're not changing it up enough. So your body's not burning the same amount of calories per unit of time as it was before. So that's when you need to seek out the help of a trainer. Maybe you need to try a new workout, maybe you need to cross train. So uh, think about those things. There's 3,500 calories in one pound of a body fat. A 
That's a lot of calories. So for some of us that seem to have a problem losing weight really quick, well, it takes a while to do it. If you do it naturally, no supplements, I say no supplements, no crazy supplements, and no uh, crazy fad diets. If you do it the natural way, it will take some time. The best way to do it is to create a 500 calorie deficit every day. So you could cut out 250 out of your diet, and you could burn 250. So that's a 500 calorie deficit. You do that seven days, theoretically it's 3,500 calories. Now not all of us lose weight, one pound of weight every week. I'm the type of person, I'll work out for a while, cut back, and I may not lose a pound a week, but all of a sudden I'll lose three or four pounds after two weeks. So everybody's body's different. We don't know exactly why that happens, but uh, everybody's uh, body reacts differently. But the, the, theoretically, that's how you do it. I want to talk about the BMI and the body fat numbers and ratio. If you guys wait in at the, for our holiday trainings, you notice that your ticket gave you a BMI number and it gave you a body fat percent. Remember, BMI is just a general number. It's kind of like your weight. So it's your height and your weight. Okay, that's, that's calculated. It's good for sedentary populations, but not for active individuals, which I consider all of us here active individuals. The BMI, like I said, is just weight and height. Well, what makes up your weight? We know that's fat, tissue, and muscle, lean muscle mass. Okay, so if you look here, you can see some of the normal ranges. Uh, Joey, if I can meet Joey for an example, we did his BMI one day and it said he's overweight. I don't think he looks so But Joey's a big guy. He carries more muscle mass. So naturally, his BMI is going to be higher. Yeah, I think he was on the 25 to 29. He's not overweight. So. I caution against using BMI. A lot of your physicians will use that, but if you're an active individual, I would much rather use percent of body fat, which our machine, if you stayed on it long enough, it gives you a body fat percentage, which is the, the amount of fat tissue you have. And that's clinically what's uh, most important. So if you look at body fat percentage, it's a better indicator of health status. We know that. A lot of common diseases are linked with high uh, percentages of body fat. Hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, it's good for both sedentary and athletic populations. It, dis you know, it, it deciphers between fat mass and muscle mass. And there's a variety of ways to check it. You can go into our office and we have the Biomed machine, which most, most of you did for this competition. Um, if you feel comfortable enough, I do skin caliper testing, and we do a lot of that with our athletes here on campus, especially the cycling team. And as you can see from that chart, men and women have different body fat distribution patterns. Men, we have more muscle, Yay. we have less body fat. Men, but women, you tend to carry more. So when you look at your body fat percentages, you have to be aware of male and female distribution. And as you get older. Okay, so I, will, I borrowed this slide from my lecture from my class, but it's really important to lift weights, to do some type of resistance training. Most of us in here that want to lose weight, what's the first thing we're going to go do? cardio, right? We're going to get on the treadmill, we're going to do zoom, we're going to go jog around the lake three miles. But don't forget to lift weights. It's really important to do some type of resistance training. I don't mean you have to suit up like this guy and do that, but you've got to do something to challenge the muscle. Um, and you can see there's, there's a difference here in the training. When I say weight training, the girl on the left, that's not weight training. And let me tell you why. As you lift weights, to continue seeing benefit, you have to challenge the body. Meaning you do more reps, you make it heavier, you change maybe the speed of the movement. But even if this lady was doing true weight training, she's going to have to go beyond those two plastic dumbbells she's holding. I don't mean she has to do what Mrs. Ronnie Coleman's doing here on the right. Um, that's fine if you're training to be a bodybuilder, but most of us aren't. So you just remember when you lift weights, when you do any kind of any type of workout, you got to challenge the body. Okay, so another another question that we get a lot, and Randy mentioned weight training uh, two to three times a week. And people often ask us, you know, how often should I work out? And it seems like when people they make the decision that they're now going to become physically active, it's an hour a day, seven days a week, as hard as they can for two weeks, and then they're never lifting weights again. That's what we see a lot. People start off way too strong, and, and they, they become sore. They're not doing the things they need to do, like stretch, and they just become burnt out really quick. So this information comes from the American College of Sports Medicine, uh, which is kind of our fitness holy grail, if you will, of, of fitness models that we follow with the Wellness Center. 
Um, so cardio, cardio respiratory exercise, how often? Well, adults, you get at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. One of the things that's not on this slide is what is light intensity? What's moderate intensity? What's high intensity? Well, that's all going to be based on your heart rate. Um, you know, what is your resting heart rate? Uh, what's your target heart rate and what's your max heart rate? Uh, a lot of fitness uh, books, fitness magazines, they will give you an equation, which is 220 minus your age equals your target heart rate? Target heart rate. Maximum. Maximum heart rate, I'm sorry. But in order to fully get what your max heart rate is, then you would need to do um, like a go to <coughs> max test. And say your max heart rate is 180. So that's your maximum heart rate, high level intensity then you would exercise at a percentage of that heart rate, whether it be 60%, 70%, or 80% of your max. Then you know what sort of intensity that you're getting. I mean, if you're exercising at a light intensity of your max heart rate, and you're consistently doing that, instead of like Randy said, where you're challenging your body, then you're going to see results a lot slower. Um, that's not to say that you should be uh, exercising at close to your max heart rate every time you exercise either. But if you go to a spin class, for example, and if, for those of you that have been will understand what I'm saying, if you follow what the instructor is saying and you keep your watts at a certain level, 180 to 210 watts, and you follow the, the uh, resistance that they're saying, and, and if you have a heart rate monitor on, you're going to see your heart rate elevate and then come back down a little bit, and then elevate, and then come back down a little bit. But you're never going to see it drop drastically like you like you would when you first got on the bike and you're just re-pedaling to warm up a little bit. So how often should I exercise and what kinds of exercise? You know, these are minutes, but you need to know what your max heart rate is and then exercise at a percentage of that max heart rate. Okay, neuromotor exercise, a lot of people have not uh, heard it called neuromotor, really. It's called functional fitness training. Uh, it's recommended two or three days a week, and it's, it's basically the same thing you've heard. Everybody's heard, probably heard the term core training, that type of thing. Looking at balance, agility, coordination, and gait. Um, 20, 30 minutes a day is appropriate. Okay, I mentioned stretch a few times. This is a, uh, if you guys, uh, I was one of these, so I can pick on a little bit. If you guys watch the football players that walk around campus, you'll see most of their shoulders are rolled forward. And a lot of bodybuilders, their shoulders are rolled forward because they do very little backward. It's all chest and upper body in the chest that strengthens that and it draws it all in. Um, and then as far as uh, just to alleviate some of the, the pain associated with beginning to work out, uh, stretching is very important. And I see a lot of our students doing this at the wellness center, which is great. Um, some of the different classes, uh, the yoga, we're not offering a Pilates class this semester, but we do have a yoga class. And just different types of stretching, and I'm, uh, again, a hypocrite in this area as well. Uh, I do not stretch like I should, but um, stretching is very important uh, along with that. Okay, Randy's going to talk a little bit about eating. Okay. So we're going to talk about nutrition now. Mm -hmm. and as, as you can tell, we didn't order anything bad. So, good so help yourself on your way out. Uh, if it was some other function, there might be chocolate covered strawberries or something. Else. Joey and I do like that, so that's why we work out. Right? But you know what's funny is people a lot of times you know they work out, they work out, but they neglect their nutrition. So my question to you is, if you're burning 500 calories, like we talked about earlier, deficit, but then you're just eating those 500 calories back, you basically just cancel down your workout. Okay, so you have to be in mind, keep in mind that nutrition is very important. I put up there choosemyplate.gov. That is what most dietitians use. That's what the American Dietetics Association uses for uh, dietary requirements, nutrition counseling. I follow that as well. It's a good way to portion your plate and kind of see um, how you're doing, give you some guidelines. You guys probably remember the food pyramid from a long time ago. That has been kind of canceled out because although the food pyramid was good, people were, were still overflowing their plates with food. So yes, you can eat good, but sometimes you're not eating a good quantity, and portion size is becoming a huge thing in the clinical setting now, because people, yes, we know what to eat, but how much of it? Sometimes you can overdo it, right? Um, I put up some basic things up here, don't skip meals. How many of you guys had breakfast this morning? Raise your hand. 
And you're just saying that because you're <laughs> I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, limit saturated. And Donuts count, right? What's that? Donuts count as breakfast, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. That might have been your breakfast. Right? Um, limit saturated and trans fats. Um, limit processed foods. Anything like sweets. Anything that has white, white bread, white rice. You know, eating a bowl of white rice is just like eating a bowl of white sugar as far as the glycemic index, and we'll talk about that later. You know, anything white is processed, so you want to avoid it. Monitor your urine color for hydration. Some of you guys are like, why, why do I want to look at my pee? I just want to get out of here. You know, you, you've heard this whole eight by eight, you know, drink eight glasses of water a day, this and that. You can do that if you feel like counting, but if you'll just take a look at your, your pee every now and then, if it's clear, usually you're in, you're in the good. And some of my nursing colleagues could probably, you know, verify that as well. So you know, look at your urine color, man. If it's clear, that means you know, you're pretty you're pretty dehydrated, pretty normal hydrated. Fruits and veggies, those are the good types of carbohydrates. Right? Some people say, well, Randy, doesn't fruit have a lot of sugar? It does have sugar, but it's fructose. It's natural sugar. It's not going to spike your blood sugar like a candy bar would, okay? Or maybe eating sugar or so, some other sweet. Okay, so fruits are good for you. That's why we have them there at the table. Obviously, vegetables are, are good for us. Proteins, make sure you get your good fats in that you're polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, or olive oil, things like that. Caloric range is 1,600 to 2,000 for women, 2,000 to 3,000 for men. That's very broad, and I can give you an equation if you want to stick on after this lecture. I can kind of tell you how to calculate the number of calories you have per day. So you kind of have an idea, I guess. Here is the choosemyplate.gov. So you can see fruits, grains, vegetables, and proteins make up one fourth of the plate. You can have a little bit of dairy. There's a more lifelike um, example. Of course, that's not as appetizing as the Big Mac and French fries, but yeah, it kind of gives you an idea of where to go with the cheese. This is one thing that Joey and I decided to add at the last minute is reading nutrition. <coughs> You've got to know how to read nutrition labels, because even though we know what's healthy, like I said, do you know what's actually in what you're eating? So I want to point out a few things. There's actually a lecture I did in my class. You want to start at the very top, number one. Make sure you pay attention to serving size. Most of us think that the serving size is the whole bag of potato chips. <laughs> That's not a serving size. There might be three or four servings in there. So if you're like me, during the fall and you're eating, you know, whole thing burritos, <coughs> if there's two servings in one bag, I have to multiply the calories times two. So the, you always want to start with serving size first. Find out how many calories are in one serving. That kind of gives you an idea. They say don't ever take the bag or the box with you to the couch, put it on a plate. Uh, food additives, kind of watch for these things when you read nutrition labels. If they say no trans fat, and then you flip it around and it says partially hydrogenated, you just put it down, it's the same thing. High fructose corn syrup, that's worse than regular sugar, table sugar. It's a man-made sugar, so you want to avoid that. Okay? The less ingredients in, in a food label, the better off you are. More natural. Okay, I'm going to talk to a little bit about goal setting. Um, you know, we've all, especially I've heard it recently on the news, you know, buy this, this stock bill. And if you lose 10 pounds in 10 days, please call your doctor. Uh, more than likely, you're not going to lose that 35,000 calories in 10 days to lose that 10 pounds. Uh, we have a lot of students come to my office. They tell me about these new diets and fat things that I haven't even heard of. You know, so I try to stick with the ones that I've heard of, like the Atkins diet. Probably all heard a lot about that. No to low carbs, high proteins. Um, you know, as far as goal setting, what I try to tell people is it has to be attainable. You have to be able. Otherwise, you're just setting yourself up for failure. If you say, I'm going to start this, and in two weeks, I'm going to have lost 10 pounds. And in two weeks, you know, maybe you've lost two or three pounds. And that's frustrating. And what I've found is, and I've lost uh, 60, 61 pounds since, uh, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Um, like I guess I played football here, and I continued to eat like I was still playing football, and I wasn't no longer exercising. So that 60 pounds packed on pretty quick. Um, you know, and I didn't have a goal of I'm going to lose this much weight or this much time or 
you know, I want my pants to be this size by that time. I just said, I'm going to start exercising and I'm going to start eating a little better. And it just progressively has happened. I've said this, and this will be the third time, but SENSE is a little acronym, start exercise nice and slow every time. Um, this can be taken two ways. Nice and slow meaning you haven't worked out in a long time and you're starting back over. And then also when you're just exercising every day, uh, you know, warm up a little bit before you start exercising. You know, you're not doing max reps on your first reps, you're <coughs> warming up a little bit. And then frequency, intensity, time, and type. You know, how often, how hard, how long, and what are you going to do? <coughs>
I don't know that I would have time to eat five or six times a day. Um, I mean, I could if I didn't work out. <laughs> but, you know, if you have, you know, you work eight to five, then, you know, dinner is five thirty or six. Um, that, calorie intake, calorie expenditure, that's what I have to look at at the end of the day.